questions or concerns? Oh, well, I guess it started recording already. <laughs> All right, let me start this webinar. As we wait for folks to pop in. Hi, everyone. Thank y'all so much for joining us where we get to speak with the Vincent Martell. Uh-oh, uh-oh, y'all. It's going to be a great conversation. Um, thank y'all so much for joining us for the Black, the first event of the Black Trans Thought and History series, y'all. So it's it's going to be so amazing. So if y'all want to, while well, before we get started, feel free to drop your name, your pronouns, and where you are in the chat. We like to give folks, you know, a shout out here and there. And so we're going to wait for a few more folks to pop on and we are going to get started. Let me see. Oh, someone mentioned the chat is disabled. Can y'all, is the chat, I can see the, let's see. Can y'all see him in the chat? Yes, I do. Okay. Oh, it's only letting, it seems like if we were chatting, it's only going to host and panelists. That is so weird. I haven't even changed the chat feature, but I'm so sorry about that, y'all. I guess Zoom. But, uh, so, but people can drop things in the q and I think. Okay. Well, feel free to drop it in the Q&A. Your name, your pronouns, and where you're based. We will shout that out too in the Q&A. That is all good, y'all. All good. So we're going to wait a few moments to get started with this evening with Vincent Martell, writer and director of Finesse and founder of VAM Studio. So we about to get it popping. And I heard you said someone was like, get a blunt or something and get ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I got a I got a blunt on deck too. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, wow. We have Tiffany from Toledo, Ohio. Oh, they oh. love you, Vincent. Oh, I love you too. Oh my gosh. Eric, they, them on unseated uh, Tong, Tongva, Tongva land, excuse me. Hey, 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 Eric. Hi, Tiger Lily. She, her from Chicago. Love you, uh, Vincent. What's oh, up, that's I love that also my my auntie is on here too so period <laughs> that's so sweet got auntie energy <laughs> period yes auntie auntie energy yes we love it y'all so we're going to get started because we're going to honor our guests and honor their time and honor our amazing co-creators of the Black Trans Thought and History series time so my name is Jamie Swift and I use she, her pronouns and I'm the executive director of Black More Radicals. And if you're not familiar, familiar excuse me, with Black More Radicals, we are a Black feminist advocacy organization dedicated to lifting and centering Black women and gender expansive people's activism across time, space, and place. I'm so honored to be in the presence of the Vincent Martel. I've been saying that the whole entire time and the co-creators of the Black Trans Thought and History series, Emerald Faith and Naomi Simmons Thorne. These are the brain children, the geniuses behind this much needed series interrogating Black trans thought and histories across time, space and place. And it's an honor to have this amazing series be hosted by Black Men Radicals. So before we get started, I want to say that this is a safe space and we will not allow any transphobia, queerphobia, ableism, white supremacy, anti-Blackness. We do not allow it. And I will kick you out of the, this amazing event if there you do not abide by these guidelines. So to not belabor any more time, I really want to kick it off to our amazing co-curators, Naomi Simmons Storm and Emerald Faith, to introduce our amazing guest, Vincent Martel. For sure, welcome. We are so excited um, that you all are here and sharing space with us as we convene in conversation with Vincent um, as part of the Black Trans Thought and History series of Black and Radicals. As always, shout out to Jamie. I feel like it just must be said that Jamie is like doing the work that a lot of people think that they are doing and are not, and she is. And we love people who are principled and who 
um, have integrity and who really are about the shit that they say that they are about. So thank you so much, Jamie, for being exactly who you are to all of us and to yourself. Um, so Vincent, our special guest for this evening, Vincent Martel, they, them, and he, him, is a Chicago-bred filmmaker and hustler whose work centers around nuanced POC and LGBTQIA plus narratives on screen. Founder of inclusive production company, VAM Studio, home to a diverse team of POC and queer filmmakers in Chicago, New York, and LA. VAM Studio is an award-winning collective and company behind some of the most disruptive narratives and branded content in media today. Vincent's work has been profiled in Vogue, Rolling Stone, New York Times, Tribune, Out Magazine, Pitchfork, Paper Magazine, Advocate, and NPR. He has also directed award-winning original content for global brands like Apple, Red Bull, and Grindr. Vincent was also named Doc Martin's first global filmmaker of the year. Martel has given lectures on inclusion and independent filmmaking at Stanford University, DePaul, NYU Northwestern University, and the School of the Art Institute. Their debut narrative, Damaged Goods, premiered in 2019 with nominations for Best Indie Series from the Streamy Awards, the Queerties, and the Webby Awards in 2020. Finesse, the highly anticipated narrative based on Vincent's life, is has premiered this summer. We are so excited um, that we are having this conversation post its release. Um, and yeah, so help us welcome Vincent into this space. Um, Naomi, would you like to add anything to this introduction here? Sure, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who attended. Um, I think this like I think this talk and this conversation is so needed right now. We see we're seeing like a relatively speaking, we're seeing like a proliferation of black trans images kind of filtering their way into the media. So I'd like to kind of um, interrogate, you know, the behind the scenes of the politics that's kind of like shaping that. And um, I don't know, I'm just trying to pick Vincent's brain. His work is just amazing. And I just can't wait to see like them in action. So I'm really excited for this space and I'm really appreciative of Vincent for joining us with it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so Jamie, just checking in, are we now transitioning into the first question? And no, we're going to actually show episode one. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Goodness. How could I know? Like, do you see Vincent? How, like, Emerald and I are. We're so ready. ready. We're like, so ready. Like, <laughs> ready to, uh... With the question. So, no, we are going to show episode one of Finesse. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, and we're about to get into it, y'all. Okay. So, one quick second. Can everyone hear? Who gave you permission to look at me? I'm sorry, mistress. Uh, I'm inferior to black women. Ha <laughs> ha 
I'm new to this. I'm not mother I'm gonna do. You know what I'm gonna do. You know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be very light. Despite warnings by the CDC urging Americans to avoid travel, the nation's airports are now more crowded than any time since the pandemic began. As we reported, California is struggling with two enormous fires simultaneously, causing many to point the finger squarely at climate change. We begin with the U.S. and Iran on the brink, and the president alerting Congress tonight the U.S. will respond. Oh, my God. <laughs> Okay, there you go, is, is, there you is, go. is this uh, backwards? Did you know I only smoke Swishers? Oh. Um, well, do you only have Swishers money? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, bear. Yeah. <laughs> I got the little pea swish in there. Uh huh. Yeah. How are you How doing? doing? Hot topics. <laughs> you better bounce over to that chair, girl. Wait, I think she's she's wearing top bar. Yes. Yeah. Uh, see, 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 see. Last week, remember, she said the black man should not be wearing skirts and heels. Could that possibly be why she's just suddenly wearing a gay designer this week? Don't add up. Okay, me and Martell. Have been watching Auntie Wynn since we were in college. Okay, mm -hmm. so like we can just turn our backs on Auntie Wynn now. Oh, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you give no kind of fun. Oh. Wow. Oh my goodness. See, like the crooked wig, the burping, yes. the crying, yes. like. You can't buy that kind of authenticity anymore. Like, it takes real courage to be yourself. Mm. Y'all think, do y'all think that I could be like a little more real? Girl, what? What? <laughs> you did not answer the question, though. Okay. Um, 
Uh, so we feel like sometimes. Nigga, don't put me in this. Uh uh. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I <clears throat> I feel as if this whole bisexuality thing is a finesse for followers. Oh, 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 oh. A finesse for followers. Are you kidding? Look, I'm just trying to be honest, you know? Like, fuck you, me. Okay, look, shit, girl, because. Shit. Shit. I, mean, I mean, girl, come on. Like, we've been living in this law for a whole year now, and I love you, but I don't know which Darren I'm going to get. We all do it for the gram, but you never, like, really turn it off. <laughs> wow, okay. Okay, kind of like. <laughs> Kind of like how you archive photos of your white ass boyfriend on your Instagram feed. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. You go. You go. Uh, you go. Let her come from sexy no, like that. No, no, no. Because I'm not the one that's over here profiting off of the queer agenda. Profiting off my own queerness. You're you profiting off of it. Because we all queer you now. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I think Kaiser's the one whose antidepressants ain't mixing too well. And that's what I think. A mental health joke? Mm. That's real big of you. No, see, you know what? Exactly. This is exactly what I'd be talking about. I'm sick of this little shit. This little shit. Y'all be ganging up on me all the goddamn time. Every time. Every time. Smoke a little dusty ass lunch. Okay, first of all, this shit ain't even dusty. Like, I went to the dispensary and I paid way too much in taxes for it, first and foremost. Did I miss something? Chris, you should go check on your man. I know it's not a wig, but it looks like a wig. I went down in a wig. Dang, look how many followers you have now. Yeah. You know, it does make me kind of wish that I would show up in at least one or two every now and then. You deactivated your account. So <laughs> Thank you. So you can just deactivate our relationship for five years? Sorry, am I missing something? No, I just didn't think that you needed credit for being my boyfriend. I don't need a credit. I'm a fucking marquee, Kai. I'm just saying it's nice to feel acknowledged sometimes. People don't even know that I exist to you. After everything we've been through? After everything I've done for you? You get it. You've done a lot. A lot, okay? And I thank you, but I, God, just like imagine how much I've had to do for myself. Of course, Kai, of course I see that. Okay. Well, we can't do everything by ourselves. We all need help. Well, I'm not looking for a white savior, okay? Wow. So then you realized that was all I was good for. I'll let you get back to your feed.
use Adderall to focus, weed to mellow out, rotazepine to cope with the depression, cocaine to serve through the gig, ambient to go to sleep after the gig, and Norco because it's fun. I mean, we all got to be on the show, right? wow I just want to say like it's I have seen this before but it's like every time I mean every single time Vincent Martel is a genius y'all okay let me stop like I'm talking let me I'm gonna get off the off the screen okay thank you Let's give it up. I don't know if y'all can share emojis still on the thing on Zoom, but um, that ending every time, I was like, you know, mm -hmm. okay, drag me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> like, um, really stunning, really, really stunning work. Um, so yeah, Naomi, do you want to get started with the first question? Sure. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into the questions. So we have about five questions for you, Vincent, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. If any audience want to weigh in or ask any questions about um, the series or any of Vincent's other um, projects, if you got any groupies out there who, who's like stalking you right now, Vincent. <laughs> All right, so the first question that we want to talk about is a question about naming. So we have some questions about um, the series for this, but we also have some questions more about your creative process and BAM as a studio and um, all the stuff. So we want to try to get as much in as we possibly can. So we're going to start with BAM first and then kind of whittle our way down. Um, so the first question is about naming. And so one of the things that we really, I think it's hard to um, ignore in a series like this, the Black Trans Thought and History Project, is how important naming is to Black trans identity and subjectivity and subject formation. And so naming to me is one of the ways that marginalized people um, reclaim themselves, redefine their realities, and um, force others around them to um, to see them the way that they are and the ways that they view themselves. So naming, I think, is a really integral part to how we construct alternative realities. So what I wanted to kind of get into um, when, with respects to VAM is the, his, the meaning and story behind them. Um, for the life, maybe I just wasn't doing my job as a researcher, but for the life of me, I cannot find what that acronym stands for. So I want to know what is the meaning of VAM? Um, where did that name come about? And through VAM, what worlds are you making possible through that name? And what are you making space for? <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And I think I've been really good about dodging exactly what that means. <laughs> so you okay I'm happy it's not just me like not okay. doing my homework. So I'm like, okay, no. maybe like I'm just I don't know. Okay, nope. so it's not me. Nope, not you at all. <laughs> I've been pretty uh ambiguous about what BAM is. Mm -hmm. And I think the the power of that is for me it's creating a, a world for us. It's reclaiming something like a name of VAM, right? And making this world so specific to us and what we create and what we, it's almost like a utopia for me is what VAM symbolizes. Um, and I started creating VAM when I was probably 21, 22. Um, so almost 10 years ago. And when I wanted to, 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 to segue into the arts sector, into media production, I wanted to make sure that we had something that was ours, something that people couldn't attach to anything else, something that didn't sound familiar or recognizable, uh, which for me almost sounds like, you know, reclaiming of a name or 
or naming oneself, right? Uh, there's a power in that. BAM to me is a safe space for, for, for black and brown, queer, trans and non-binary folks to, to create in their wildest of dreams. Um, we make that happen. And I think when you go to the BAM website, it's like this, this, this rabbit hole of just archives because we wanted them to, to be a, a, a time capsule for us. You know, we knew that the type of content and productions that we were creating were, 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 were time capsules of, of our history that will be here long past us. Um, and we take legacy really, really seriously. Um, the other answer is I was high as hell on the beach <laughs> in Barcelona, <laughs> thinking about onomatopoeias, wham, bam, 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 bam. Oh, I like bam, bam, B. It's not my initials. Um, a lot of people think that, but my my middle name is Martel. And so it doesn't, it doesn't reckon, it's not an acronym for, for me uh, or myself. I wanted BAM to be ambiguous for a reason because it was easier for people to attach onto that than just me myself. Yeah, if that makes I sense. like that. I really like that because what that kind of means to me is that in the ambiguity is a capaciousness that people can invest in and be a part of. And I know when Emerald and I was kind of um, articulating what we what what we were trying to encompass with the use of the word trans, capaciousness was also a theme for us. And so we wanted to really highlight for us when we're talking about trans, although there are trans identified people in this space, part of the project and leading the project, when we, this, when we are referencing trans, what we are more so getting at here is experiences and discourses more so than a firm identity. So I like that capaciousness and the ambiguity and the possibilities that exist in that. Absolutely. So, Emerald, did you want to um, kick the second question? Did you have something else you wanted to add, Vincent, first? I thought that I heard you about to say something. You know, I'm, I'm almost, I'm thinking that, you know, Black folks, we never get the opportunity to live in this, this abstract zone, right? And I think, especially in, in media, especially when creating images that transcend to mainstream, right? We never get the, the, the opportunity to be unconventional. In fact, white folks in the industry will try really fucking hard to make sure that you stay in your lane, right? That you mm -hmm. define yourself at all times. Um, and, and again, I think, bam, the, the, the essence of us not knowing exactly what that is, is it shows power within black creators that we can do that and not have to explain ourselves all the time mm -hmm. um, to white people specifically. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for, for, for yeah, finding that. For sure. Um, I'm gonna ask Naomi to take the second question actually, because I have sure. the wrong document actually pulled up here. So I'm gonna get the other one and then I'll take three and four from you, Naomi. Okay. All right, so we're gonna move on to the second question. So the second question is a little bit about the theme of um, the theme and how theme is kind of filtering into this space right now and um, how we're using theme to kind of organize the content that we're curating for this series. So the theme for the, um, this section is called Intimacy, Intimacy Sex, and Pleasure. Um, and so the two um, offerings is what we've been calling them. The two offerings that we curated for this section was this um, panel and discussion that we're having right now, and also an interview with a really incredible South African artist named Mercy, um, whose artwork, visual artist, whose artwork depicts um, similar themes, Black, queer, and trans, intimacy, sex, joy, and pleasure. So um, as Emerald and I was curating for this section, um, Finesse, um, 
we start gravitating around finesse because of the way that we think it depicts those themes and the relationships that it has to those themes. And so even when I was like doing research, some of the reviews and um, interviews that I read that you did, you also kind of talked about how um, finesse participates in those kinds of um, discourses and those depictions. And there was something that you said that really stuck with me. And, I, um, and it's, I'm interested in what you meant by this. And I also have a follow-up question to that too. But you mentioned that you wanted uh, this series to be a sexual, colorful roller coaster for Black people. So what that means exactly, I'd be really interested in knowing. But I'm also curious um, when it comes to uh, um, the creation and development of this series, what depictions, as it relates to intimacy, sex, and pleasure, what depictions of Black people on film were you either kind of talking to, with, against, as this series developed? <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful question. Um, it was really important for me to show how powerful Black intimacy was and is. And in finesse, uh, I got the opportunity to show an un unapologetic representation of what I saw that as. And for me, that is fun. It is wild and a roller coaster and it comes in waves and it's not always, you know, clean. It's not always the, 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 the most comfortable at times, right? But when we're sharing that together, I find that the intimacy between the th three roommates, these three homies, the tribe, is almost more of a display of intimacy than, you know, Martel fucking someone or Kaiser and Martel. You know, I think what I wanted to do is redefine what intimacy could look like, period, right? I think some of the most romantic relationships that I've had in my life have been with my, my, my girlfriends, my homies, you know what I mean? My tribe, where I, I call, you know, some of my friends, my, my soulmates. And showing that as a black chosen family is something that we already know, right? That is romance, that is love, that is intimacy to us. And I think what most people don't know is that, you know, that chosen family can function as so many different things for us. And I've never seen a, a, a nuanced display of that on screen before in the way um, that I wanted to. Um, I wrote Finesse when I was in deep, deep therapy in a very, very dark, dark, dark place. Um, and my therapist asked, how does intimacy show up for me in my life? And so I went to the page and started to write this screenplay of how it showed up in my life and found that, you know, the, the moments that I felt most connected to other humans was when I was with my chosen family, right? And so in finesse, you see two very distinct uh, displays of loneliness where you have, you know, these people, these roommates fighting to, to stay alive, to show intimacy, to make money, but you also have them showing intimacy to one another in order to survive the pandemic or the 2020 uprising or killing of George Floyd or the bureaucracy of Chicago politics or politics in general. Um, through the intimacy, through the smoking of the joints, through the touching, through the, the display of vulnerability, I think we get different layers of intimacy that makes it feel like a roller coaster in the essence of, of finesse. Can I just say really quickly, I really, really, really appreciate the conversation about the significance and emphasis um, of intimacy in the context of like, non-romantic sexual relationships because I think I was just having a conversation about polyamory recently and this person was like like the the problem with hierarchy is like like relational hierarchy it's like oh, okay I'm in a romantic relationship with this person and that relationship means more to me 
than or is more important in my life and more significant than my fucking best friend right. or my niggas or whatever right. the fuck, right? And like, we normalize that like as a thing. Definitely. And I think that what is so fascinating to me is that even you saying the, the most romantic or, or, or heart filling kinds of intimacy that I've shared have been with actually my friends, yeah. right? I think that is something that is so important because as a person who likes love, tea blends and herbal tea and all that shit, I never even thought about what kind of intimate experience it is for my niggas to come over and I'm making us a pot of tea, yes. right? That's intimate. Yeah. Like that is intentional and purposeful and, and fulfilling in like different ways or like, oh, I'm going to buy you some flowers. Let's go to, right? Like all of that shit is also like life giving and sustaining in a way that I think that we are conditioned to, um, invalidate or minimize when we are in romantic sexual partnerships. And I think that something that is just so present in my life right now in the way that I'm like, even, um, um, what's the word? Consuming content is also about that. It's actually, okay, so what, what is intimacy actually? What do I, how do I create a balance for myself? A, so I can be a better friend, right? Like my niggas don't get dropped off every time I'm fucking somebody, <laughs> yeah. um, but, but you know what I mean? Like that feels really important too, I think. And I think that it's something that we are not conditioned to interrogate at all. So I really, really, really appreciate that is something that you've emphasized here and is a through line across the series. That's Thank my spiel. You. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Emerald, did you want to um, kick off question three or? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. For sure. All right, A. Um, so. The next question is, what does it mean or would it mean to humanize and normalize Black, trans, and gender non-conforming people? How does film and moving image media contribute to this, pro uh, to this project? And the second part of that question, as a culture worker, how do you navigate the many investments and logics currently driving the calls for diverse representation by audiences and the industry? So if you want, you can do the first part of that question first, and I can repeat the um the second question when you're ready yeah i think honestly i could probably answer them all in in in, in one um for me coming from chicago i think i'm an activist by nature you know so what's happening or what has happened in hollywood is it's almost felt like this 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 trend to push inclusivity, to, to push diverse talents, you know, and white people in the industry will use that as a buzzword, right? What I'm about is making infrastructural change that will last long past me. And what I found in having the privilege of running my own production company, um, which I made sure to do that. So I had equity in making the types of decisions that I'm going to go through is I wanted to make sure that I was not only telling the stories that I wanted to tell, that the people that I wanted to tell them were reflections of the stories being told and that people were getting paid. People like us getting paid in the industry and getting the chance to get their foot in the door so that they can stay inside the house. Um, with, with FAM in general, I make sure that we're doing the extra work of mentoring, of bringing people who might not have the, the accessibility of being on a production set or getting that experience of looking at a camera or shadowing a director. Uh, we do that daily. We do that on every production. In fact, there's always a non-conforming or, or a trans identity next to me shadowing me as a director. Um, that's just been me, period. And so if we can continue to do that and make that, make that the regular, make that a mandate throughout all productions and production crews and production sets, we can make everlasting change, I think. Um, what I'm doing is not waiting for Hollywood or anyone else to get it. You know, I think we've been waiting way too fucking long and I have the resources now to do it. And so we're doing it. And that's been the really beautiful thing is like, we're not looking behind us to see who's following us or who's catching up. We're going to lead and hope that people get it. But if not, we're gonna make sure that we're moving and finessing the industry 
to make sure that the resources and capital that we get are funneling through the community. So VAM in a lot of ways, although we are for profit, we have always operated as a nonprofit. We've always made sure that the profits that we've made go to the pockets of the people in the community. Um, whether that's us shooting in the community, on the South side, in the hoods, bringing people who might not have that experience, et cetera, making sure that sponsorships align to our values and our mission, which is big. We don't take money just to take money. We say no 90% of the time to people who come and inquire about working with us because VAM is a safe space for not just me, but for those trans folks, for those, those queer non-binaries, right? And so I take, I take it very seriously um, when, when someone comes to, to, to collaborate or, or be a part of our community in a transactional way. Um, I, I, I'm vicious, especially when it comes about my people. And so I think finesse and bam, it created a foundation for us to, to base all of our future productions off of. Like this is the template. This is how you do it. Now it's time to take that to the mainstream to make sure that everyone does this. Um, yeah. I'll just add one other thing because I'm just like thinking about all these things about like, what does it mean to not what does it mean, but because we, we know what it means to like have those kinds of investments and the kinds of things that we like have to lose out on because we are principled, yes. right? So like, what are the stakes and the sacrifices of being principled in this white supremacist like world, right? Um, like as like black queer and trans people who wanna do a very specific principled uh, work that has integrity, that is honest, Right. Um, and I think that that is, again, like a thing that really makes me feel good about Black and the Radicals and Jamie in general. And also like the fact that this series can exist in the way that it does. And we can have this conversation with you and like screen finesse. Right. You know, like those things feel very like it requires. I don't know. I think that it, there's something about, again, the stakes of being principled. Um, in the work and purposeful and intentional that I think is really uh, present in what you're saying about what does it mean to have to say no 90% of the time, and right? Like what does it mean to, yeah. Go ahead, repeat yourself, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it, to be that principle sometimes it's incredibly lonely to, to, to spearhead these types of things that have never been done before or there's no template for it. Um, I didn't go to film school, I dropped out of college um, I didn't have a mentor in the industry. I was the mentor for new people, new industry, new filmmakers. And so, you know, people like myself, people who are orchestrating radical things like Jamie, you know, sometimes it's really, really important to, to see those, those radicals as human, right? Because it is incredibly lonely and in making BAM and creating space for all of these beautiful identities, there is a lot of a lot of isolation that happens, right? From outside of your community and within the community. And it takes time to, to make sure that you're focused on the people who are actually intentionally building with you, but it's tough. It's really, really tough, especially when you don't have the resources. Um, them is 100% controlled and operated by me um, at the current moment, right? I fought really, really hard to make sure that big producers and Hollywood insiders didn't get equity of VAM because I wanted to make sure that it, it stayed uh, true to who we were and for the people that we were creating for. Um, but it is lonely, you know, it, it is tiresome. And sometimes you, you have to be about the work and not about the clout, which is something that I've learned recently is that if we're going to do the work, we really got to be about the fucking work and the work first. And the last thing I'll say, just like in this conversation is also like the reality that like there is no perfect place, right? Like there is no perfect organization, no perfect business, no perfect whatever the fuck, right? Like that's like doing the work, the job, I guess, or the, or the, or the expectation for ourselves is to aspire to it knowing that we'll always fail and that's okay 
Yes. I think the problem is when we accept that, oh, we'll never be perfect. I might as well fill in yes. the blank. Ridiculous yes. shit, right? Yes. Um, and so I think that that's something that has also been hard, you know, like the people, it's, it's like something so like gut wrenching when you like, oh, there's this person that I love and they make really great work and then they do some fucked up shit and you're like, oh my God, you're a human, right? And so I think that like, the, that's the thing that also I think is really important too, is to just in like, in being principled in a way that doesn't feel like righteous, but that feels um, intentional and honest, right? Yeah. Also about what it means to be a human in this space doing this work. And also that niggas got to eat. And like, what does that mean, right? Yeah. In different times and, and spaces and places. So yeah, um, I don't know what question we're on. Naomi, do you know by chance? It's beautiful. <laughs> I really love that. Yeah. Yeah, I can um, take this question and I'm actually really happy about this one because Vincent kind of gave a leeway to it. So Vincent, you said something. You said some you said I didn't have there wasn't no template. I didn't have a mentor. And so this question actually plays on that a little bit. And so I'm not sure how familiar you are with um, like structuralist literary and film criticism, but this question is kind of related to like that line of inquiry. So in structuralist, structuralist film criticism, there is a conversation and discourse that happens around the ways that archetypes and genre um, kind of confines the creativity and structures the creativity. And so the line of thinking pretty much goes that when art, when artists and creatives are producing, are producing some kind of work, they are participating in these genres and these archetypes and the, their participation in said archetypes and genres really confines and constrains what it is that they're able to produce because they're either producing um, in line with or in response to. So it's like these structures are always kind of controlling what's happening. And so one of the things that I find really interesting about the depiction of Black trans and queer people um, is that because of the uh, mainstream unwillingness to actually depict Black trans um, and queer people and gender nonconforming people um, on television, on film, there is not that many archetypes and um, genre conventions to speak to, with, or participate in. And so that, that space, I think, um, creates both possibility to do things that's never been done for, before, but it also inheres, in my personal opinion, responsibility too. And so right now there is like this crop of filmmakers, directors, um, showrunners who are really, you know, trailblazing with their depictions and representations of Black trans and gender nonconforming people. And of course, we can think about Pose or P Valley or any number of these shows that's kind of doing, of Vincent who's here, any number of the creatives who are participating in this kind of movement. So because you are participating in this and you are trailblazing and, you know, um, out there on the cutting edge, you are kind of, in a way, creating the archetypes and the conventions that future and later creatives are gonna have to either respond to or respond against. So how do you see your depictions of Black trans and gender nonconforming people as these kind of, you know, um, like these cutting edge, new, uh, full of possibility, uh, depictions, but also with this like consequent, these consequences that are gonna like have their own ramifications as well. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful question. And this is something that I've, I've meditated on a lot. Um, I think for me, it's, it's, it's about showing the liberation of black trans identities and non-conforming people. I think for me, it's about showing not just the, the traumas and the pain and the struggle of it all, which I think is what mainstream media is, is, is living in now when it comes to, to those identities. But, but my angle is radical in a sense, because I think, why don't we show the beauty and the fun and the life and the adventure of that group, right? I think for, for me, when it comes to my work in general, 
it's about not just showing the struggle, but, but showing the beauty of the life that we're living today, right? It's about sometimes just having a, a full on scene of just people sitting on the couch and smoking a joint, period. That's radical because we never get to see us just living in the moment, right? Um, I am so privileged to, to be a, a filmmaker during this time. And I think what artists like Katori Hall are doing and, and, and what creators are, are doing for series like Pose are, are great, amazing, right? And what they're doing is, is creating the step for me to just fucking go there with it. You know, I think these representations are, are great because it's, it's an intro to what could be. My job is to take it further. And I think when looking at, you know, these archetypes and, and genre, it's important for me to, to, to denoise that, right? I think, we don't live in a laboratory. Results aren't our only being, you know? Criticism and critiques and Black Twitter can't just be what defines success for us. And so, you know, I, I've done a really, really, really good job at making sure that when I'm in the creating phase, I'm blocking out everything. I'm not thinking about genre. I'm not thinking about types or characters. Uh, in that sense, I'm thinking about how can I show the beauty of these people in the most authentic form, right? And of course, that's going to come with a little struggle and trauma. We all have that. Um, and there's beauty in being flawed, right? It's okay with showing that. Uh, but there's, there's, there's life, there's, 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 there's fun, uh, there's celebration that I want to see more on screen. And I think we all want to see more on screen. And finesse is a, is a representation of that. It's just an appetizer of what could be. And hopefully, very likely, we'll get the opportunity to, to transition into TV um, and show what other identities in that world could look like. Um, you know, for me, I, I came of age in, in the queer club, in the nightlife scene. That's where I got my start as a filmmaker, right? Trans people are the bedrock of that. And so it, it's my responsibility of not just as a filmmaker and artist, but as a person, as a human being um, to, to celebrate and give back to those people who made room and space for me to get where I am. Um, and I try and work on that every day. It's a learning thing, right? Like, like Emerald was saying, we're all flawed. Um, we're all learning. And I think there's beauty in that. And so I'm, grateful to be surrounded by by variety of different nuanced people who can help teach me and guide me so that I can make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing always. For sure, thank you um, so much for that. Naomi, is it your turn or mine? No, it's my turn, right? See, I- Whichever. Get lost. <laughs> okay, okay. You just did question for oh you had a second part to that question do you want to ask the second part of that question naomi or do you want to move to question five um no i wouldn't ask that question too okay go ahead for sure okay um all right so this actually is okay so this question and you touched on it a little bit kind of plays into the response that you just gave us so you just mentioned how um trans people are the bedrock of these queer subversive um, countercultures and subcultures that a lot of us have found um, community and safety in. And so one of the things that I've noticed about um, the way that people respond to your work um, is that your work is often celebrated for its queerness, but your work is rarely ever associated with the word trans, even though you depict trans and gender non-conforming people consistently throughout your work and you work alongside them as well. And um, trans and gender non-conforming people are very integral to your creative process. And so I was curious, what do you, what do you think that says about um, the state of like our culture and films and the way that people understand 
um, these images, the fact that people see this kind of queerness in it that deserves celebration, but do not see a transness, if you will, in, in it. <laughs> right, yeah, I think it's a failure on their part. And I think, you know, this is recently become a thing where I've had to make sure to include trans people into my interviews in the conversation to make sure that they know that, you know, this isn't all about queerness. And one thing that I find is that, you know, when we're having mainstream media approach creators like myself, right? There's this, this hesitation to see all aspects of us, right? It's, it's a way to commodify us for their market. And so what I've, I've been trying to do is be really intentional about the people who, who get to ask me those questions. And so, you know, what I've been able to do is really be intentional and specific about the people who I hold space with and dialogue with and make sure that they know that what I do also includes the trans experience. Um, so I've been doing a lot less interviews this year, <laughs> a lot less interviews. And I think what I found is um, the, the publications, the, the platforms that I've been speaking to this year have really been about the work, have really been about seeing me in all of me, right? And that's what I want to continue to do because it's more fulfilling, right? It, 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 it's, it's, more, it's more of a, a risk for me to, to have to explain myself to a white person who is only interviewing me because the Beyonce album came out and mm -hmm. black and queer and trans is now relevant, right? And so making sure that I'm not chasing things for the trend, interviews, press, publications, writers, making sure that I'm holding space for black and trans writers and researchers and journalists and prioritizing them. And I continue to do that and will continue to do that in my mainstream work too, right? I think once I get my TV show, cause I'm getting that TV show, I wanna prioritize black and trans people in those press, in those interviews, getting them the first look, making sure that they get the eyes on it first. Everyone else is extra. Um, but right now it's, it's about me speaking directly to my communities with finesse um, and hopefully that'll continue. One thing I just wanna say quickly that feels so like important also is that like alongside that there also seems to be this like these very rigid ways that we see and identify transness in people. And so if a person does not like look the way that you think that they should look as a trans person, they are not trans to you, if, yeah. even if they identify as such a move through the world in that way. Yeah. And I think that is something that is so, I mean, like predictable, but also it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I think that that's something that feels very, also very important to name is that like, in thinking about that in making media and even doing the series, right? Like what are, like, why is it important to very consciously, I think, be aware of, oh, okay, who are we inviting into this space? How are they identifying themselves and their work? And like, what, how are we perceiving, what does it mean to identify as a black trans or queer artist and to make that kind of art, right? And I think that that is something that I have if it, you know, it's a thing to be like conscious of at all times. And I also, it's something that I've thought about since we first started thinking about this series and this is something that I've kept in the back of my mind. Um, so I also just wanted to add that alongside what you were saying and to appreciate and affirm the things that you were saying too. Um, yeah, I mean, and it okay. all speaks to, um, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, I'm listening. Yeah, it speaks to the team of the, the, the artist, right? and. For me, you know, in the past, uh, starting off, just to be real, I had a white publicist. Um, and not saying that all white publicists will have an issue connecting, you know, me with the platforms of the people who actually know my community, but it was difficult. It was incredibly difficult for, for writers and journalists to, to not only see me for who I am, but name it, 
right? And talk to me on it, on the process and what that experience is. Um, this year is the first year that I haven't had a publicist and it's, it's been so fulfilling to know that I can connect with, with people like you all, right? Black women radicals who hold space for me to talk my shit, for me not to have to explain things and over explain. Um, and I think that's been liberating for me is knowing that I can connect with the people who matter by myself on my own. Um, and that's beauty, I think. Yeah, for sure. And with that, we are gonna segue into our final question, um, which is, um, there's a striking parallel between the genesis of finesse and the writing of Proud Shoes, Polly Murray's 1956 memoir, and the first known book and autobiographical text published by a Black trans author in the United States. They both owe their completion to the self-care practices of their author, art, authors and therapy in particular. Can you, and you've mentioned this um, a little bit earlier. So can you talk about your series and its beginnings as it relates to therapy and self-care? Absolutely. No, I think Crowd Shoes is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I think everyone, if you're in this now, please, please, please read that. Um, it, for me, is just one example of the power of healing for us. Um, finesse was me going back to these childhood attachments and healing that inner child, right? That monologue of Kaiser saying that they take Maritzipine to cope and, and Norco because it's fun and all of these things to suppress those emotions. Those, that's me, that was me at one point. Those are, those are my, my words uh, on, on that screen. And so with that came this understanding that if I'm going to tell the best story possible, if I'm going to be a, a storyteller that's, that's raw and real and honest, I have to be honest with myself. And that mean, meant opening the wounds and really dissecting these things that I have ignored for a really, really, really long time. Um, I think for me, my job is to facilitate communication. I think that's what directing is. That's what being a filmmaker is. And Dr. Thema is a really wonderful therapist who talks about healing and the journey of healing, right? and how when you actually do the work to heal, you're opening up your homecoming. That is what this was for me. Finesse is the homecoming. It's, it's me dissecting all of these things that I've ignored and putting it on the page for all of us to dissect together. Um, there's this vulnerability that um, I think is powerful when Black people just unleash it, right? And I think in finesse, you see that the most from, from the raw expression of vulnerability to complete rage at the very end, right? Episode five is, is me showing black rage on 10. Um, that's all part of the journey. It's all part of the, the, the emotional experience to be, to be us. Um, I think that's what makes finesse so, so beautiful. And I think the more I really did the work and dissect it, you know, what my journey of healing looked like, the better my, my voice became, the stronger my aesthetic became, you know, the, the more bold that visual hit. Um, and I wanna continue to do that work and heal in this industry because, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, lost souls here, I'll just say. And so it's even more important to have that foundation and do that work before you get thrown into industries like this. Um, and I'm really grateful that I took the time and energy um, to shut off of the world and cut off and deactivate Instagram and Twitter and not check email, right? Radical thing for, you know, someone running the company um, and to rest and to be still and to take multiple naps, right? And to cut off my phone for a day. These are radical things that are now, you know, we're seeing with this worker revolution that's happening in our, in our country, but for black people, it's reparations, right? Um, I'm thinking of the NAP ministry and how, how 
radical that is to just be still and to sleep and to take restorative rest. Um, these are all a part of things that helped me to better, better learn who I am. All great methods of, of self-care that I think led to me being the strongest filmmaker that I've ever been, the strongest boss I've ever been, um, the strongest community leader that I've ever been. Um, there are people change everything. And so I, I'm really grateful for, for this, this journey. And, you know, everyone is a part of this in me, with me. I think sharing finesse is, is opening up that invitation to, to everyone to experience it. With. Yeah, and I think the beautiful thing is like, therapy makes you a more honest person. And that means you make more honest work, right? Like if you are walking around like, so heavily leaning into the delusion of it all and lying to yourself, like you can't make honest work, you're delusional. Um, so I think that like, that is something that I've also learned just like being in therapy is like, oh, it, good therapy requires honesty. Yes. And it helps you get there even if you start off lying to yourself. Good yes. therapy and being able to end therapy at some point or whatever require, like one of those things is honesty. And I think that, in the context of art making, it makes you a more honest and therefore better artist. Um, yeah. So let's give it up for Vincent. Woo! Those are questions that um, have been prepared for you. And um, now we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. So if you are out there and you would like um, us to share a question that you have, I already saw a question from Kay that I have thought about. And so I think it's a really great question. We can start there. Um, and then as we work through that one, folks can feel free to drop also thoughts and just, you know, comments or whatever, shoot the shit um, in the Q and A. So um, Kay's question, do you want to read that Naomi? Do you want to read Kay Anderson's question in the Q and A? Sure, I'll go ahead and read it. Let me see if I can pull it out. Yes. All right, so Kay Anderson's question says, the opening scenes of episode one remind, remind me so much of Mistress Violet and how she talked about Black feminisms in a Black feminist politic of pleasure guiding her down work, especially as a queer and intersex person. What does the opening scene mean to you? And what made you interested in bringing together BDSM, kink, Black transness, and literary texts by Black women for one scene? Yeah, I love this question. Um, I do too. You'll see in the credits that Mistress Violet is is credited in the special thanks um, because Mistress Violet and I, we were basically in communication throughout pre-production and Mistress Violet initially was meant to play Darren, um, the role that Jesus Louise is playing. And for, for those who don't know, Mistress Violet passed um, and one thing that was really powerful is how much Mistress Violet and I got the chance to talk about the power of being a Black Dom during pre production. And, you know, it was really, really important for me to have someone who knew that life was authentic to the role of being a Black sex worker. Um, and so Mistress Violet for me is, is the template of incorporating literature into Dom work. Um, and I feel so grateful and privileged to have spent that time kind of developing that character and just talking through the possibilities of what this could be. Um, Mistress Violet passed, um, I think very, very shortly after we had finalized the script. Um, and, you know, I feel with in all of my heart that they were there doing that process. Um, I think that my queer ancestors, my, my, those who come before me are always on set and we, we take time to, to honor those. Um, and Mistress Violet is, one of those queer ancestors for me. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is really beautiful. Um, 
we're going to segue shortly. Let's see here. Wait, I saw a question and now it's gone. There was a question that I, okay, okay. Um, what is next for Van? Um, Vincent, what are you working on? And are you going to release more episodes of Finesse? Yes. So, I mean, there's, we've been really, you know, vocal about, I think Finesse is ready for TV. Um, I think it, it's ready for mainstream. I think what we've always been able to do as Black people is be the bedrock of culture. Um, finesse for me is that. Even now, looking at what's on TV now, you know, I can't help but imagine how exciting it would be to introduce characters in this world um, into that sphere. Um, right now, you know, me and my team are being really intentional about the people who we're bringing into our orbit, making sure that they see me as, as whole and making sure that they see my community too. Um, as we all know, it's, it's you know, trendy to, to pick up a, a black queer creator and put them on TV and make, you know, a hit. Um, we're not looking to make a hit, we're looking to, to change culture. Um, and so that takes time and it takes patience. And I've been really lucky enough to meet some really beautiful people in the industry who've been great advocates for what could be a TV show for Finesse. Um, FAM as a production company, you know, we're, we're being really intentional still about the brands that we've worked with. Um, we just worked with Nike with the first black female skating collective called Fro Skate and just shot a really amazing campaign for them. Uh, we wanna continue to do things in that space. We wanna continue to infiltrate and reclaim the space that we deserve. Um, you know, we're, we're also going into screening a really amazing film by Fatima Oscar called Retrieval, um, a really amazing short film about the exploration of discovering oneself after a uh, sexual assault. Um, we're really trying to do the work and have the tough conversations um, across the board. Uh, I'm now in LA. I moved here about a year and a half ago from Chicago. Um, and so shit's getting real serious. So I'm making sure that we, we expand our resources and bring them back to the people who, who we're creating for. For sure. Okay. Um... Let's see. Okay, um, what advice do you have for young radical filmmakers looking to follow in your footsteps? Ooh, that's a beautiful question. Um, you've got to start with your community. Like, I, I think I didn't have budgets to do anything in the very beginning. Again, I didn't have the resources. I wasn't in the industry. No one was checking for me. No one was answering my emails, right? And so what I started to do was create with my friend group, right? Also aspiring artists in their fields. Like 10 years ago, I was working with Shea Coulee um, on just like small editorial things in my, in my bedroom. This is right after she announced that she was going to try and be a drag queen. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's working with the people who you know has your back and just creating what you can. And it doesn't matter if one person sees them or like a million, right? It's about actually doing the work that you love and developing that sense of community while you do it. Um, that's always been how I, how I kind of, how I get into it all of the creating is knowing that I started with a small group of radical friends and, and, and we did the work for ourselves and because we liked it, not because anyone else was checking for us. Um, and I think that's the advice that I would give. Look, look next to you, look, look who you're creating with or who you wanna create with um, and, and, and do it, you know, just do it. For sure, thank you for that. Um, especially the piece about like, do it because like, 
like make the shit to make it not because you know for people to check for you but because like it's what you know that you need to be doing right now and I think that that's reorienting to a different um intention right yes. Yes. makes the even the process I think more enjoyable and honest um okay the last question we have here how do you see um the Black trans artist community in Chicago evolving? And what are some ways that access can be intentionally extended to Black trans people? And you've touched on this a bit, but that's just the last question. Yeah, no, and I think to, to reiterate, we have to put Black trans people in the position to make the calls, right? We, we have to give them the resources to do the damn thing. Um, and, and we have to be, protective of them. We have to be protective of them. We have to be protective of them. We have to protect them. Um, one thing that I've learned is that it's not just about giving someone the resources to do it. You got to make sure that they're protected in the, in the right environment to actually do it well. Uh, that's one thing that I see Chicago doing is there's a beautiful organization called Brave Space Alliances in Chicago. Um, and they're doing the work for trans identities in Chicago uh, and making decisions with trans people at the top, right? That's kind of what I see happening on a wider scale in the Chicago art sector. Uh, and that's what I hope to happen more in production, specifically in BAM. Uh, me letting, uh, you know, my sets open to being mentored and, you know, having students shadow those sets. It's it's a step into that direction. Um, I think the more that we all do it, the more I think, you know, typical it becomes, right? Um, but I think Chicago is doing a really, really beautiful job at kind of spearheading that effort and doing it in a really radical way. Um, and that's kind of what I've been, I've been witnessing, just being, being away from it. I miss that. I miss that a lot. And so I hope to bring that to, to every city I work in. For sure. Wow. Go ahead, Jamie. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'm just very overwhelmed with how like amazing this conversation has been. I couldn't have asked for a better first events in this amazing series curated by Emerald and Naomi and Vincent like you are it seriously. And I'm so happy for all the amazing blessings that are in store for you because you deserve, deserve. And so do Emerald, Naomi. So thank y'all so, so much. Um, so beautiful. And I just want to give um, Vincent a final word and also Emerald and Naomi final words for Vincent. Um, I mean, this has just been one of the most fulfilling conversations that I've had in a really, really long time. And I, I know this has been in the plans for a, a while and it just feels really lovely to hold space with you all. And uh, I just feel so privileged. So, so thank you all. This is just such a lovely, lovely, lovely experience. Sorry, I was checking the chat again. Um... I am sitting in abundance and gratitude for um, the opportunity. And I mean, I say this all the time, all the time, I will shout from the mountaintops about Jamie down, okay? And I think that that is, Jamie sits on my heart um, so heavily as a person who I've known for like the majority of like my graduate school experience and somehow I'm still in school, oh my God. Um, but I think that it, it matters it matters with whom and where you do things. And I am just so grateful that like the Black Trans Thought and History series ended up where it did. And that I think that Naomi and I, um, it, is, it is where it's supposed to be and it's doing what it's supposed to do. And I am grateful for that. Um, I'm so grateful for the, just the off chance that I saw um, the article on Autostraddle about, about finesse that I watched the trailer so many times and I excitedly sat on Zoom and I was like, y'all have to watch this. This has to be a part of this series somehow. Um, and that you are also just so warm um, 
Vincent, I was scared. I was like, I don't know, you know, people, sometimes people aren't nice and don't want to do things. And it was like the opposite. And I was like, oh whew, my gosh. Um, and that felt really good uh, just to feel the warmth um, of your energy and spirit, even just via email. And um, I'm so grateful that this worked out the way that it did um, and that finesse is in the world and that people can see it and share it and love on it and on you and your team um, because it really is um, wonderful work. That means so much. Uh, yeah, of course. Naomi, I don't know if Naomi's on. Yeah, I had to come off camera, but okay. just in summary, I also wanted to reverberate a lot of the things that was said. I would like to thank Emeril for like bullying the heck out of me and Jamie to like engage with like Vincent's work. I'm really glad that I did like, and I've really like, I just, I don't know, it's, it's just powerful. It's powerful, it's moving. And I think it is, um, I think it is worth of its time. And I think it's work that defines its time too. So I have been just um, really thrilled to engage with the work and I'm looking forward to see what comes next. Um, I'm really thankful for Jamie as well for just giving us a forum and um, like an institutional home for this project and to facilitate conversations like this and more conversations like this in the future. So I'm just really happy about the work that everyone's doing, all the work that we're all contributing to both here on the panel and also in the audience. And I'm just looking forward to seeing what comes out of all of this. Yes, yes. And one final thing, I echo everyone's sentiments, but Vincent, you have no idea how we were afraid to send you an email. You do not understand, okay? You don't understand. We were like, oh my gosh, are they gonna respond back? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And so this is a dream, it's just not real. From you, Vincent, to Sierra, thank y'all so, so, so much. Um, and then one comment, Sierra said, beautiful, beautiful conversation, Vincent, I love you. Um, BWR, y'all are amazing. So thank y'all so much. Really are. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you for owning space. And it, it means the world to people like me. Oh my gosh, well y'all, this conversation, thank you, thank you, thank you. This conversation will be uploaded to Black Mar Radicals YouTube. Make sure you follow Vincent, Finesse, and Vam on all platforms. And just thank y'all so much for everything. We'll be posting a recap on BWR social media as well. So have a good night and blessings to everyone. Thank you. Much love. Bye, y'all.